Welcome everybody and a special welcome everybody and a special word of welcome to two special guests. Kula Sinisteris, curator of the SABC Art Collection, and Edward Sumele, journalist and independent arts writer. Uh, we are looking at a special exhibition curated by myself for Strauss and Company. Uh, it is a pairing. It's called Social Stances. We're looking at the work of George Pemba and Robert Hodgins. The reason why we do these exhibitions is to give people an aesthetic experience uh, of a museum quality. Many of the institutions, most of the, all of the institutions are closed, as you well know. And we thought it good to let uh, people have an experience of a very special kind. It is educational um, in, um, in its scope. And it is also adding to the art ecology of South Africa in various ways, as I will explain as I go along. We've been doing this for the past three years. The first one was in 2013, a meeting of minds where I paired the work of Louis Macubela and Douglas Portway, two very different artists, two people who came to art from very different um, uh, uh, entry points. But at some point in their lives, in 1967, to be precise, they met and they met in Cornwall. Portway, a South African, already lived in England for a good 10 years. And uh, Marco Bella visited uh, the country. He traveled via Spain and France and met uh, Portway there. The two of them got on like a house on fire. They had a lot in common. They both liked Paul Klee. They were both uh, interested. In, uh, in Eastern philosophy, and they, in, uh, they, they influenced each other's work uh, in a profound way. Um, last year, I paired Gladys Mugudlandlu and Maggie Lapsher, again, two very different artists, living parallel is, uh, lives, essentially. They never met, as far as we can gather. Gladys knew about Maggie Lapsher, and Gladys, because she lived in uh, just outside Cape Towns, made a point of attending all of Maggie Lauch's exhibitions uh, in Cape Town. And this year we are looking, I'm looking at um, George Pemba and uh, Robert Hodgins. Now, just to give you a sense of what I mean by the pairing, here you have Douglas Portway on the left and um, an example of Louis Macubella's work on the right. And uh, in terms of Maggie Lauch, again on the left and uh, the, uh, a landscape by Gladys Mugudlandlu on uh, the right. So we are supposed to, the three of us, we're supposed to walk through the exhibition. The exhibition is up at uh, our premises, 89 Central Street in Houghton Estates. But because of co uh, COVID le uh, lockdown level uh, four, we're not allowed to do that. And so what I uh, can offer you uh, a series of slides just to show you what the installation actually looks like. Uh, you can also access the exhibition via our 3D gallery on our website to give you a good sense of uh, the layout of the exhibition. And maybe we are lucky after the 14th of July and get down to lock, uh, lockdown level three, and then people can attend, uh, of course, by making appointment, but for the uh, appointments. But for the time being, this is what the exhibition actually looks like. Now, uh, for starters, I drew on three major collections for when I put this together. The first one uh, was uh, from the Miki and the late Mwabisa Kaiya collection. Uh, she sadly died just before the opening of the exhibition. She uh, was a very enthusiastic art collector, a huge Pemba holding, and she was very eager to assist when I approached her uh, uh, asking uh, uh, her to, to, to lend some of the uh, works to the exhibition. Uh, and in a way, this exhibition is essentially in her, uh, in her honor. So a good third of the Pemba works on exhibition is in fact from her collection. Uh, the second big collection is uh, of uh, Robert Hodgins' own private collection uh, in the care of uh, Jan Mietling at the moment. 
I visited Jan in Mekrank. He showed me a good uh, 40 works, uh, extant works. And I again made a, a good selection from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Robert's personal collection. And um, then I was also fortunate in, uh, uh, enough to uh, stumble across a private collection with a Pemba archive consisting of many drawings, uh, sketches, photographs, uh, letters, uh, journals, autobiography, uh, and the like. And already you can begin to see how I put the, the, uh, the, the how I went about pairing these two artists, looking at the, just for instance, this, the stance, the, the, the figure, uh, the agitator of, of the Pemba work here, and a very different work from Robert Hodgins. Um, but again, you have that raised on, and among the drawings and watercolors in the archive, you also have a sense of uh, a figure study there in the middle. Um, and uh, these works were, of course, augmented by uh, works in the SABC collection, and that is one of the reasons why I invited Kula Sinisteros to join us. Uh, the pairing here, obviously, of boxes, uh, the boxes in a ring, the work on the left uh, in the SABC collection and the one on the right in a, uh, in a private collection. Uh, Kula, do you want to say one or two things about the boxes in the SABC collection? Mm. Sorry, I'm uh, just unmuting. Yes, I haven't quite prepared to talk about Pemba more for more Hodgins, but what is interesting um, in this pairing even is the differences between Hodgins Boxer, which is angry and cloudy and full of power, versus quite a tight frame of the boxes in this ring, where the boxes, even though they're in the audience, they could be in the street. It's like the street life, there's always this communal kind of um, connection of street life, whether you're in the ring, whether you're in the street. Whereas with Hodgin, so it's got a, quite a private, strong self-focus. He, he could be the boxer who's identifying with the all-powerful. It's kind of more or less what I think I can say about this. Okay. Um, so, 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 so um, one of the when I when I look at uh, uh, you know the, these artists to put together they work side by side. The first thing would of course be looking at their style and here you would agree you know that they are they work in very different styles pemba if you like i would describe his style as a type of social realism uh, and hodgins on the other hand at the other end of the spectrum with uh, what i want to call an expressionist abstraction so to speak so they are from different eras as well. Pemba working in an early modernist uh, 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 tradition in South Africa, whereas Hodgins, I think, is considered to be sort of a, a contemporary artist. But uh, just expanding on the idea of style, uh, these two works remind me very much of the, the American regionalist painters, such as George Bellows, who, of course, made a number of uh, paintings with uh, boxes in the ring. Uh, I'm just showing you one uh, example on the left. And then um, Hodgins, his work reminds me of uh, Francis Bacon and uh, in, of the 1950s, uh, what he did there. Francis Bacon and such artists as uh, Giacometti, for instance, their work, their movement, so to speak, is called existentialist art. Uh, and I am reminded of, uh, of uh, these styles. So it's interesting to look at where these two artists are positioned uh, on the continuum of uh, styles from the modernist to the contemporary era. Jan um, Yetlin also uh, subsequently sent me this image. It is also in uh, Robert Hodgins' private, it was in his private collection of a group of boxes. Uh, and um, looking at the work um, of um, uh, Hodgins on the exhibition with Man with Bandage here. It reminds me very much of a seminal work in the Bits Art Museum collection, uh, Beast Slouching it is called, uh, where you have the bandages uh, on the arms and perhaps uh, this part of the body as well. I think a metaphor, if you like, for uh, a change in political dispensation in uh, South Africa. This work was done in 1989. Um, so, so very interesting to look at uh, the stylistic uh, differences between these two artists. 
Uh, of course, when you look at subject matter, uh, when you pair these two artists, it is a completely different matter. And on face value, two very, very different works. Uh, but, but both interiors, if you like. Ho uh, Robert Hodgins, Poker Night, a still life essentially, with a very interesting sense of perspective. You can just see the two hands of the poker player on the table in front, um, and uh, perhaps with interesting uh, views in those black uh, areas at the back, compared to a very conventional interior, if you like, by Pemba. But Look carefully on the tabletop there, and you see nothing else but another interior. Uh, but again, a no less uh, complex uh, sense of perspective that you do get there, suggested by the picture within the picture at the back of the, uh, the wall there, and of course, uh, the, the, the view outside the house, uh, and uh, even through the curtains uh, on the right hand side. So very interesting. Now, um, if you look at uh, this work, uh, I, I mentioned the archive earlier on, and I was very fortunate to come across a drawing, a sketch, a preparatory sketch of this particular scene. And it is quite amazing uh, to, to page through all the little sketchbooks and notebooks uh, by Pemba, because you can actually see how he composed, how he planned uh, his uh, paintings, uh, everything uh, uh, down to fine details, such as the cloth over the, 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 the woman's shoulder, uh, as you can see over here, the picture here with little notes, for instance, move this person back towards the back here. Uh, the use of color, for instance, light and dark, and on the side, they put the dark in front and uh, the, the light at the back and all the light. So he, he planned his works quite carefully. He was a very classic artist. And uh, it's interesting to see uh, how, how the drawings actually prepared him for, uh, uh, for the work. Now, apart from the interior scenes, also what goes on in the street, as Kula mentioned earlier on, and Pemba painted such scenes as the bus shelter. Clearly in Johannesburg, he visited Johannesburg with the Hilbert Tower in the, in the background there, uh, inside the buses or inside the train, as you can see on the right-hand side. So how people went about their, uh, their daily lives. And I'm interested in this particular work because again, very fortunate to stumble across a number of drawings in the archive where he tried out different compositions, uh, different uh, uh, configurations of people uh, in, in, in a bus, in a train, for instance, and you can see how he composed this particular work and the elements he chose from the various preparatory sketches uh, in order to do, to, to, to do that particular work. Uh, Pemba, of course, met uh, Gerard Sokoto in Cape Town in 1941, and uh, Sokoto, as you well know, uh, painted many of uh, 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 such like scenes, you know, uh, uh, on trains, in buses, in waiting rooms, as you can see here. Sokoto was also the person who told Pemba, uh, you know, I really, want to urge you to take up oil painting on canvas because nobody's going to take you seriously if you just continue painting watercolors on paper. Uh, and I think Pemba took that to heart and uh, the rest, uh, uh, of course, is, uh, is, is quite phenomenal. Now, um, this is probably my, my favorite in the whole show, my favorite Pemba on the whole show. The waiting room, um, and I am pairing that uh, with a, a work by Robert Hodgins' consulting room. Now, uh, Edward uh, was fortunate uh, enough to, to come around uh, yesterday or the day before to have a quick look, uh, and he was also struck by this. Edward, what do you think of these two works? No, I think this is quite brilliant. Um, if you look at, uh, for instance, at George uh, Pemba's uh, work, uh, that is the waiting room, you can clearly see that these are people who are sort of uh, waiting for something, possibly some sort of service from a government department. It could be home affairs. It could be, um, you know, it could be maybe at the post office or something. But um, you see, you speak to the idea that Pemba always um, depicted the lives of ordinary people. But if you look at the kind of work that he produced, you can see a bigger picture. 
You can see the conditions of those people by just looking at this image. And they don't look very happy. Um, they, they look very, very kind of very sad. Um, so this is quite amazing because it took somebody who had a very, very keen interest in the living conditions of the people about whom he, he, he penned So this is quite interesting. I really, I really think, I mean, by just merely looking at this picture, you can, you can almost take yourself into, 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 the, into that kind of society uh, that you lived in. So for me, this is quite interesting. And, uh, and and if you look at uh, and, at uh, the Hodgins, yeah, yeah, and then you look at at Hodgins, it's, it's very striking because this is a co uh, consulting room, and if you look at these people, they don't look also very very happy. It could be somewhere, maybe they're waiting for a service, they're at a doctor's room or something, but it's a totally different. Um, you can tell the site from where they come from is different from the other ones. Here, for instance, you can see that there is enough space uh, between the two people. They are a little bit more comfortable in the way that they are seated. But you, you look at uh, uh, George Pemba, you can see those people are almost squeezed together. It's very, very uncomfortable, stifling. So for me, that's very interesting to look at these two pictures and sort of uh, try to engage in the kind of society that we're trying to depict. So I guess uh, Pemba here is depicting the lives of black people at that time. And Hodgins is obviously looking at the lives of white people at that time. So we can read a lot by merely looking at these two pictures, the kind of society that existed then. And I guess, of course, we know what South Africa used to be at that time. Perhaps that's what is, these two pictures are trying to tell us. Yeah, yeah no, indeed. And, uh, and you know, I get the sense of isolation here. You know, uh, they are almost in a row, echo, uh, reinforced by these uh, horizontal lines that you see here, uh, these uh, people in, uh, in their, uh, in their iso isolation. Now, uh, you know, we are still looking at uh, what is similar about the subject matter. And again, I was very fortunate to put these two works together. Uh, perhaps people at leisure. Uh, Pemba on the left-hand side, attending an open-air concert, uh, yeah. Zulu dances and uh, 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 singing. And in the, in the archive, also in those journals that I mentioned earlier on, he mentioned often going to Durban and being so fascinated, so impressed by uh, what he called a very typical African uh, uh, in, in, inborn rhythm of uh, the, the, the Zulu dances. But what is striking for me here is the presence of the policeman on the side there and perhaps a police door a dark there as well, very indicative of the times. Look at the date in which this was produced, 1981. Uh, so, so really the heyday of apartheid. But yeah. uh, what, what, what struck me about these two would be that, again, that very strong horizontal line in the Pemba work and also in the, uh, the Hodgins work. Now the Hodgins work uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, I think, uh, a, a very interesting title, look but don't touch. You know, so you have again the, the audience, the viewers in front there, and perhaps looking at uh, a painting in a gallery, look but don't touch, or uh, uh, all the likes uh, uh, here. So people, um, uh, 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 what they do with their leisure time, I think, is also uh, quite striking. What these yeah, two yeah. and do. also, sorry, Valem. And also, uh, when you look at these two pictures, you look at the open air concert, the George Pemba one. You, you you can you can see of course you can you, you spoke about the police there with the police dog it makes you to ask questions like what did that police dog want exactly at a concert was it to protect the people or was it to actually uh interfere with what they were doing there so it is quite a um a thought-provoking uh, kind of uh, pending because it makes you question the kind of society that existed then the kind of relationship between the people and the authorities yeah. Uh, authorities being represented by the policeman with the dog there. And if you look at uh, George, uh, my Robert Hodgie, you can clearly see these people, like you said rightly, that they could be in a gallery, they're uh, looking at a sort of uh, a painting. And if, if we assume these people exist at the same time, you can clearly tell the kind of uh, sort of entertainment they, that they enjoy these two groups of people. 
on one hand, gallery space, they're enjoying uh, looking at pictures on the wall. And on the other, these people are at a concert and then there's a police. I don't see anything that says these people are being uh, sort of, uh, I'm talking about uh, Robert Hodgins. We don't see any kind of authority nearby in that pending there. But there we can clearly see. So this perhaps tells us about how society was divided during that time along racial lines and the relationship that they had with authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice, very nice uh, comment there, very perceptive. Now, the other thing about uh, Pemba's work is that he also attended to uh, traditional African life, to, to Zulu history, as you can see in these two, two examples there, the one on the left, Sangoma, and the one on the uh, uh, right, uh, Assassination of Shaka. Uh, now, um, uh, I was very interested in this particular work, Sangoma, because again, in the sketchbook, I came across these two ones, uh, uh, preparatory sketches for uh, the, the, the Sangoma work, uh, especially the one at the top with the idea of a very classic, very formal composition of triangles and squares and uh, uh, diamond shapes there plotted out, uh, to, of course, to create a balance in the composition and then uh, worked out in the gestures and in the uh, positioning of uh, the figures here. So, so for me, it, the, the archive is a wealth of information to get an idea of what went on in Pemba's mind when he painted these, when he planned these, how he went about uh, uh, painting, uh, painting his stuff. Now, Robert, on the other hand, uh, didn't do a lot of preparatory sketches. You know, uh, I spoke to young Nietling the other day and he said, Robert would start by putting a, a blob of color on a canvas and then took it from there. You know, so, so his was a completely different way of, uh, of working. Um, I'm also very interested in this work, the assassination of Shaka Zulu, because uh, it is part of uh, the history of uh, KwaZulu-Natal, the history of South Africa, uh, and many artists, including Cecil Scottness, address this particular topic. Now, uh, one of his famous uh, 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 portfolios of woodcuts, of course, the assassination of Shaka, where he told the whole Shaka story in a series of no fewer than 43 uh, of these prints. Uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, we often uh, at Strauss and Company offer the whole set the whole portfolio, uh, but uh, all those images were also collated in a special book. I, I'm showing you the cover on the right hand side. And it's interesting for me uh, <clears throat> to see that uh, the actual assassination only comes at print number 42, the second last print in the Cecil Scottness' uh, work with a very dramatic stabbing of uh, Mbopa, uh, who stabs, uh, who stabs uh, Shaka. And um, uh, you will also know that the poems were written uh, for this by the poet uh, Stephen Gray, uh, and a very dramatic poem about that assassination, Shaka, son of Senzangona, of Nandi, Zulu, successor of Dina Chwayo, shelter of men, women, children, people of thunder, struck with a very dramatic work there right at the end. So it's very interesting to see how other artists actually attended to, uh, to, this, particular, uh, to this particular work. Whereas here, I think uh, you have uh, sort of uh, the pity, the sorrow uh, uh, embodied in uh, uh, Nandi uh, in this particular uh, work by, um, uh, by Pemba. Now, um, Edward, I also want to ask you about this one, George Pemba, Hotla. What are we looking at here? Do you know? Um, yeah, here is very interesting. Um, here it looks like, uh, obviously, this is a, a Hotla is like a traditional sort of uh, gathering. It's where important issues in the community are being discussed, uh, like hot issues there. And obviously, you can see that... Uh, there is a uh, Nkombo. Nkombo is a traditional beer because obviously when they have these traditional uh, meetings, uh, usually there will be towards the end of it, there will be some sort of, uh, I wouldn't call it a party, but today you would call it a party, which is sort of, uh, you know, just a bit of drink. This is a traditional beer there. 
uh, it's quite very interesting because it tells you a lot about the kind of uh, art that he practiced, George Pemba. He was very much connected to the community from where he came from. Uh, even though later on, of course, he went to urban spaces and he depicted that, but you can tell here, uh, he was very much rooted within the communities. Uh, so you could observe all these cultural um, events, like in this case. Uh, this is quite interesting. And so I couldn't resist uh, putting this uh, Robert Hodgins next to it, because this is sort of like, if you like, a, a modern day version of uh, that traditional meeting here, a difficult meeting of the board. So, uh, so, so I, I think that is quite a nice one. And if you look at that group of figures in the middle there, it reminds me very much of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the posture here of uh, this figure. So it's interesting to compare them. And again, um, I, uh, I, I stumbled across two, two, two sketches uh, that, uh, that he uh, used to, to uh, plan uh, this particular work. Very interesting to see, very schematic over here, and uh, perhaps the, uh, the part at the top looking at how he would apply the color, so uh, so to speak. But Edward, you, you, you actually, I ask you to write about this particular work, Ubu and yeah. the Black Politician. Can, can you tell us some more about this? How did you go about unpacking this work for us? Yeah, this is very interesting because um, uh, maybe a bit of a background. When this work was painted, which is 1983, um, it was against the background of very tense political situation in the country at the time. The state of emergency was 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 in place, um, but during that time also there were some negotiations that were taking place behind the scenes between. Uh, South African, led by South African, uh, or initiated by businessmen, white businessmen in South Africa with the a XL ANC at the time. So when you look at this picture here, in a way, it's a very brave depiction of the, the thinking at the time, the political thinking. Uh, you can see here, here is this uh, um, Ubu, for instance, which represent a white man, powerful, dress in a suit, but also you look at the, the black uh, politician. He's also wearing in a, a suit. He's very smart as well. Uh, you know, so here's a depiction of, uh, if you like, two equals. At that time, I think it was quite controversial to, to depict, because these people really, I mean, the black politician was seen as terrorists at the time. But here he came and is depicting them as a sort of equals in that sense, in terms of how they are dressed. And I think it speaks a lot about uh, Robert Hodges thinking at the time. To, we can imagine at that time he was away, given his status. I mean, he was an academic, he was a quite uh, an away artist. So he, he might have known about these things. He might have known about the background talks that were taking place between the ANC and uh, the National Party government, obviously led by the white business people at the time. So for me, when I look at this, it talks a lot about, uh, we can see uh, Robert Hodgins here becoming politically involved somehow. And the fact that he could use uh, Ubu to really depict what he wanted to say, sort of made it easier for him to, to navigate the political terrain. As you can imagine, at that time, it was not an easy thing to do as an artist. So he went into the space of an activist artist sort of a protest art, if you look at it, if you want to say, uh, that was brave. And I think he could get it away with, he could get away with it because he was using Ubu, like instead of going directly. So it was it was not very much uh, overtly political, uh, but you could, you could tell it's almost like uh, today's comedians. Comedians today can get away with a lot of things because they could be poking fun at you uh, but saying very, very important things that are very important and you laugh and you think that's like kind of fun. But I think that's what he managed to do and he could get away with it. So this is, I think this is a very, very important kind of work in as far as depicting the, the political situation that was prevailing at the time. And also the fact that Ubu now was uh, sort of, uh, could, could be used to delve into the area of politics. Um, was quite very interesting and be able to get away with it uh, at that time, which was a political charge situation. 
uh, like I said, with the state of emergency and all those sort of that changes that was happening. Uh, so this is quite important. And also the fact that, you know, a white guy and a black guy seated next to each other was quite controversial at the time. Because, I mean, at that time, these people were seen as enemies. But here you are, you have these two gentlemen uh, wearing, uh, you know, tie and a suit. They're next to each other. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the white guy, who there is even touching uh, uh, this, this, uh, the black man there. Uh, so that's quite, quite very, very interesting. Um, uh, this is a very interesting uh, picture that depicted a very important time in the history of this country. I really, really uh, love this. It makes you think, it makes you understand where Robert Hoogins was coming, uh, was going into at that time. I think it was being political away. This is clearly um, a, a protest art, if I might put it that way. Okay, so you will also see, uh, thanks for that, you will also see that this is in the Tatham Art uh, Gallery in Peter Maritzburg. Uh, and so and apart from the SABC uh, that was so uh, kind to lend me some of their words, so was uh, the Tatham. Uh, and it's important to bring, you know, these fantastic private and corporate art collections and public uh, uh, art galleries uh, back into the public imagination, especially under uh, sort of the lockdown conditions where we find ourselves now. Ubu, as you rightly pointed out, uh, that was a sort of a fictitious character invented by the French uh, dramatist, the 19th century, late 19th century French dramatist, Alfred Jarre to comment on the sort of like uh, the foibles of people in power, uh, like dictators, you know, quite pathetic uh, people uh, and uh, causing a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of harm. And I'm reminded of a wonderful, very wonderful exhibition at uh, the old Gertrude Pozel Art Gallery at Witz in 1997, <clears throat> where Rory Dupel curated a, a special exhibition of international artists dealing with uh, that uh, a figure of Ubu and also the collaboration between William Kendrick, Robert Hodgins and Deborah Bell, who each uh, of those artists made a series of prints based on the Ubu, um, uh, the, the Ubu character. Uh, Pataphysics, I put the definition there, the realm of the imagination beyond the metaphysical, you know, the physical, the metaphysical, and then you have the imagination. So, uh, so a fantastic exhibition. And this was, of course, uh, Ubu was a, a recurring figure in the work of Robert Hodgins. Uh, he, uh, especially in the early 1980s, as uh, you rightly pointed out, uh, Edward, he painted many of those Ubus, but uh, somebody in my research for this exhibition showed me an example of an Ubu painted in 1960. So it's interesting that Robert was aware of uh, uh, the, the, the potency of that particular uh, character uh, for political commentary as early as 1960. Uh, and you see in examples uh, like this, the agitator, another political theme, and even this one, uh, the return of the exiles. Um, anything else you want to say about this one, um, uh, 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 Edward? Yeah, this is quite interesting because when you look at this penny, you almost uh, picture um, the situation when the exiles came back in the 1990s, you know, all these guys who were exiled uh, come back for negotiations. And it almost has a religious, uh, so this would say it's a reception, could be at the airport or somewhere where, um, or it could be even at home where they are being um, welcomed by a community that had not seen them for quite a long time. And if you look at uh, uh, some of the ladies there, they're wearing sort of a uniform, uh, that is church uniform. Um, I'm not quite sure whether this is Methodist or it could be Catholic, but this is clearly church uniform and a lot of uh, communities that go to church, they wear this on Sundays. So it was almost a Damascus period, I think, uh, to welcome these guys back from exile. Uh, you can see that it's an emotional moment. Um, it's, it's very emotional. It's a mix of emotions. Uh, I wouldn't say maybe happiness there, uh, but yeah, it's very emotional. It's very touching. Um, it's a depiction of the, the exiles coming back. 
in a way, you know, telling us about, you know, the end of the hostilities just before the negotiations took place. This is quite interesting because uh, Pemba, often people would say, you know, it only depicted people's social living. Uh, but if you look beyond that, you can clearly see that he was also very, very political. He was aware of what was happening. So if you look at this picture, it gets straight into the, you know, into the thick of things in terms of what happened in terms of reconciliation, in terms of exiles coming back, being welcomed back by communities, a very emotional moment, like in this case, it was clearly, clearly very emotional. Yeah, thank you. And, and it's also interesting for me, you know, how uh, religion and politics at the time, you know, you have the idea of liberation theology uh, in the 1980s, and you can see it uh, here as well. Um, but speaking of religion, and here I'm simply going on the, uh, on the title, the Sistine here, uh, but I think Kula, you have uh, you have uh, a, 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 another interpretation of this work. Can you talk about this one uh, for us and tell us what's going on here? Sorry, unmute myself. Excuse my voice. I'm recovering from COVID, so I'm going to Sorry. more read than anything. Um, this. Um, sort of work I acquired um, for the SABC from the Goodman Gallery. And it was probably one of the first major large works purchased in 1999, and some years for our major Making Waves exhibition. You know, each time I see this work, I see it differently. I mean, even now when we were talking, when you were talking earlier about the meeting room of those two works, um, this is also a meeting room in a way the meeting of, of God or the self. So again, it's, are you seeing it differently? It brings on different meanings all along. And the strongest which remains for me is about the celebration of being oneself. And what I've always felt about this work is the idea of hovering, of wings, floating with uncertainty and certainty. The four linear panels gives a vertical emphasis to the work, which then gets offset by the strong horizontal lines. But the one dominant line remains, which is the middle line, the horizontal red, the dividing line, the figure, the mind, and that line is of uncertainty, or is it certainty? The figures are like angels, clothed in white, making it, making it light. The shadows are almost reflections. The richness of the yellow, gold, and red, for me, it implies a spiritual knowing, a four-dimensional spiritual being in the world, but not of, not of it. It's quite an important thing, that. So wings of uncertainty, certainty of the unknown. Is it the artist's wings of certainty? and the delivery of the mind. And then we've got there is a prison. So we've got the prisons reflected by those small windows, troublesome doubt, but not enough to eclipse the artist's well-honed confidence. Even though it's referencing windows, figures that seem to be tiptoeing, or are they actually dancing? Is it an imprisoned mind, a curtailed uncertainty? Doubt, rendering the human condition helpless and a hostage in shadows between the spiritual and the experienced world. Again, wings of uncertainty, certainty and anchor. So the weightiness and the richness of color anchors the condition. First, for instance, the tension and potential anxiety, harangues and need, questions searches to know where to from here. And then secondly, it enhances and ameliorates the confusion of knowing. So it's not unlike a pacing as in a waiting for God a moment. There is a groundedness of push and pull, push and pull at play throughout this work. Nothing remains unintegrated. There is a cohesion of being of self. Again, certainty, wings of uncertainty, certainty, a kind of owning of sensuality, the fluidity, 
essential celebration of this are lodged in the painterly four figures in themselves, meeting the world, meeting the spirit, meeting the God in full flower, in full bloom, as if to say, see how I sing? Hodgins concretizes the ego, the inner self, the journey within and with sexual liberation and affirmed sensuality oozing the bodily, fleshy, spilling into the spirit. A kind of embodied confidence, a self-truth in good times before death and looking towards the potential of another birth. So Hodgins sold and sells me the confi confidence in this work and I do buy into it. It feels familiar. And yet he tells so much is unknown and what of his insecurity, an exploration beautifully rendered as a sistine itself. So that defined line again, where there are four figures above and below, has the art suddenly the power of heaven, the above and the below, the thus spoke Zarathustra. Hodgins cheekily portrays the here and now. The drama of life, my dear boy, given forth as Neil Dundas rightly pointed out the other night, is not being served to the gods in this work. I think of the world we are living in now, the pain, the void shrunk from the artist, from us, but knowing that the unknown is certain, lest we should forget. But this, of all works by Hodgins, is a masterpiece. Certainly, certainly, I agree with you fully. It's an amazing work. It is quite magisterial. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, when I looked at it again, uh, the expressions of, uh, on the faces, quite, quite, quite phenomenal, rendered in uh, these wonderful, wonderful colors. So truly, truly a remarkable work. And I'm very pleased it is uh, in the SABC collection. Mm. Um, <clears throat> these are just some of uh, the other uh, works, you know, if you look then at Pemba, what would Pemba uh, do, you know, the, the uh, figures, uh, believers in the street, in the church. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, that I like about uh, Pemba is, uh, you know, the attention he gave to his immediate environment in the Eastern uh, Cape. Port Elizabeth specifically. And uh, again, when you look at those journals he wrote about his life, uh, he makes the distinction about different classes in New Brighton, in the, in the township outside Port Elizabeth, uh, saying that on the one hand, you do have the upper echelon, you, uh, you have uh, the professional classes who want to emulate, as he says in his journals, sort of uh, the Europeans, Western uh, culture, you have uh, the doctors, the lawyers, uh, the, the court interpreters, the academics, the journalists, the chiefs, and what have you. And here you have examples of uh, his famous portraits, our famous writers, such as Shul uh, on the right, and uh, H.I.E. Clomo, the collected works that he painted there. The, this particular portrait also appeared on the cover of uh, Glomo's biography by Tim Cousins called The New African. Um, and I'm showing you these because uh, one of the works on exhibition is a portrait of Saul Plyke, his granddaughter. And uh, in the journal, Pemba also distinguishes, as I say, about sort of the one class, uh, the professional uh, black and uh, as opposed to the, to the uh, you know, the illiterate uh, uh, black people also in the community. But making sure that they don't, that they still have their dignity, as you can see in this particular portrait over here. Uh, and uh, they are the great source of inspiration for a lot of life in the, in the township here. Just, I think, as uh, Robert would uh, put his uh, model right in the center here. And it's also interesting to, when you compare these two works, uh, to look at the picture within the picture, uh, surrounded by, uh, you know, surrounding this particular figure here. So, so I think dignity and awry humor or scorn, if you like, towards uh, society I see 
in these two particular uh, works. Now, um, one of the joys of curating an exhibition is to, to put things together, you know, and I thought these two works fit perfectly together. On the right hand side, you have uh, boys at play playing dice in the street by Pemba, and then you have these two mischievous uh, uh, creatures called the two boys by uh, Hodgins on the left. Uh, and it worked until we started cataloging the work, only to discover that behind uh, Robert Hodgins's work, there's a poem. He actually wrote uh, a poem at the back uh, by W.H. Uh, Auden. It is called The Two, or the alternative title is uh, Witnesses. Um, he only copied out the first stanza and the very last stanza. And uh, Auden was, of course, one of his favorite uh, uh, po uh, writers, authors, poets. Uh, many of uh, all authors' uh, uh, poetry anthologies uh, were in his, uh, uh, were on his bookshelf, so to speak. And uh, when I looked further into this particular poem, it was very interesting to see the very active, even up to today. This was a poem written in the early 1930s, by the way. Um, but how people still to today disagree about what the poem actually means and what those two people actually are. Now, on the one hand, uh, you say, and this is, uh, uh, it's a pity because uh, I had to cut out a lot of the other stanzas here, because a lot of the imagery there, a lot of the allusions are actually to uh, the two archangels mentioned in the book of Revelations in the New Testament, in the Bible. Uh, and many people got stuck on that religious interpretation, but uh, more recent interpretations ha have a completely different take on these two. And what they actually invoke is, uh, is a psychoanalytical Freudian interpretation. Uh, uh, Auden, of course, was, uh, was uh, a, a fan, if you like, of Sigmund Freud. And uh, if you go along um, uh, those lines, you can actually see that the two in Freud's mind would represent on the one hand, the libido and the, uh, the it on the other hand, the libido, the sexual um, uh, impulse and the it, uh, the, um, uh, the, the instinct. And these two, and that is why we have uh, the, the, the other, the alternative title here, witnesses, uh, these two are witness to the, 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 the struggles of the heart, so to speak. And I think that might have been what, um, what, uh, what Robert was after when, uh, when he painted this figure. So, so it's interesting to, to discover all these different views and interpretations of, uh, of the work. But nevertheless, uh, a great work. And again, a lot of uh, drawings. This is just one of them in the sketchbooks where he grouped together uh, the, the boys at play. Now, um, I started by saying the title of the exhibition is uh, Social Stances, and certainly these two artists did take up different stances, different attitudes towards the society, the main uh, source of the inspiration. But society, on the other hand, also had specific views of them. And these are just comments I pulled together from the literature uh, what people, what critics, what friends actually said about uh, them, so, uh, of George Pemba. Uh, he was the grand old master of township art. He was the Norman Rockwell of South Africa. He was a Goya. Um, uh, he, uh, his art was like the French, uh, the early 19th century French artist, uh, Jean-Francois uh, Millet, uh, William Hogarth among South African black artists and he was part of uh, the Eastern Cape uh, a colonial vision. Um, and uh, he then was sort of like discovered, if you like, at a, quite a late age in his life. He of course had a number of exhibitions, but the main one was in 1991 at the Everard Reed Gallery. I'm showing you the cover of the catalog on the left. Uh, and in that catalog, he was labeled the grand old master of uh, township art. Later on, uh, he um, was honored by a retrospective exhibition at Ezekiel South African National Gallery in Cape Town in 1996. And I'm showing you the cover of uh, that particular uh, uh, catalog. Uh, an example, this is the, the, the copy he made of the famous Gleaners painting 
of uh, Jean-Francois Millet. Uh, and here are examples of his own interpretation of harvesting, of gleaning. Uh, quite interesting. He, in the archive, there are a number of sketches of old masters. I'm just showing you this one. Pemba was also very fond of uh, uh, Jan Vermeer, for instance. Uh, he obviously clearly saw examples in art books uh, in the local library, in uh, Port Elizabeth Library and the likes that inspired him uh, to do that particular work. Uh, of Robert Hodgins, people would say he was undiscovered at 82. Um, and those of you who know his biography, his life story, certainly he taught for many years at, um, uh, started off um, at the Pretoria Technical Arts School um, in 1953. And then in 1964 went on to Witz, where he taught until the early 1980s. And uh, then he absolutely flourished and uh, became quite a big name. Uh, he was South Africa's greatest colorist. Uh, and his art really looks at the historical and um, the experimental in, uh, in, in South Africa. This is the catalog of um, the 1986 exhibition at the Grahamstown Art Festival. Uh, he was the invited artist. Standard Bank, of course, sponsors the Young Artist Award. Uh, Robert was by no means uh, young at the stage, so he was uh, uh, the guest artist. And uh, 1953 uh, uh, here, refers to the date when he returned to South Africa. He came in 1938 uh, to matriculate. Um, you know, his uncle sponsored him. Uh, he matriculated here, but then uh, served in the military during the Second World War, went on to study uh, in London and only came back permanently in 1953. Uh, and in 1986, that was the date when he was honored uh, as guest artist um, by, uh, by, the, by the Standard Bank um, um, uh, exhibition at, uh, in, in, in Grahamstown. Okay, so, so, so I think uh, we, are, uh, we are at the end of this. Uh, perhaps Kula and uh, Ed, uh, Edward, if you have to give uh, Pemba a label, if you have to give Hodgins a label, what would you, what would you say? How would you, <laughs> uh, would you invent a new one? Would you align yourself with one of these? What do you think? Mm. Edward, let's start with you. Mm. Oh, well, I love both of them as the artworks, but I think they were really in touch with the society uh, from where they came from. So they were very social conscious. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Akula, what about you? Mm. Yeah, I, Edward, I agree with you. And then I, I just feel there's a, there's a, a total cohesion with, with the context of that which each artist came from. And there's struggle in both of them of some kind. Um, I, I, and I suppose I, I, I lean towards looking for that spiritual thing in both the artists. Mm. And when it's played outside of that, I enjoy it. Mm. <laughs> there's a, a play, a tease, a naughtiness, certainly in Hodgins. But yeah, thank you. I think it's a very, very clever, very smart move to put them together, Will Hell. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed doing all of this. Yeah. Okay, so that's all from us. That's all from us. Um, as I, as I, uh, let me just see, I think, uh, yeah, just uh, if you want to find out more, certainly go to our website, Strauss Art. Uh, we, the 3D gallery, the virtual 3D gallery is available so that you can see the, the space. Uh, the link is there. Uh, there's also a program of events. Uh, tomorrow, for instance, uh, I'm doing another talk for art teachers, uh, uh, of course, school teachers. And then we also have the e-catalog available on that particular link. You will also find that on the, the website. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so the, the printed copies of the catalog uh, a bit delayed because of uh, our printers in Cape Town, uh, but certainly we hope to get uh, copies of those soon. So if you are interested, do contact us and do reserve uh, uh, a copy for yourself. Uh, but please do check out our, our website where you will find a lot of uh, other information. 
Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining me, Kula and Edward. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Valhalla. Right. Thanks, uh, Arisha. Okay.